homeless had a stark choice to make, spend a night in the casual ward or face another night on the streets. In reality, it wasn't really much of a choice. Vagrants often searched in vain for benches so as to avoid sleeping on damp floors and, even if they were lucky to find one, the night would be spent shivering against the cold or being moved on by policemen enforcing draconian vagrancy laws. If you weren't turned away because they were fully occupied for the night, then the casual ward at least offered shelter and food for those with nowhere else to go. These were often simply people who couldn't work or find work, such as the infirm or the elderly, and had subsequently fallen on hard times. For the destitute, this form of accommodation provided some respite and sustenance. However, food and shelter wasn't free. The penniless still had to pay, and they paid with work, harsh work. In 1902, Jack London, an American journalist and social activist, sought to discover the underworld of East End London. He wanted to experience the abyss, the depths of poverty which people were suffering in the metropolis as the city transitioned from the 19th to the 20th century. In order to do so, he disguised himself in working class clothes to walk the streets unnoticed. In the previous video, we met Jack London in a queue for the casual ward of the Whitechapel workhouse known as the Spike. This time we join him as he enters and discovers the grim reality of its surroundings and the insipid food that residents endured. But that was the least of the troubles that awaited him on this trip to experience the wretched lives of the poor. For he was made to work to pay for his bread and board. Work so gruesome that he could stand it no longer and ran off down the street. Before we start, please consider clicking the subscribe button in the bottom right of your screen for more content like this. If you find this video interesting, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and share it widely with friends and family. These two things really do show your support and help the channel grow so I can bring you more. Thank you. Check out the description for links to more interesting videos about the Victorians and take a look at the channel page for even more content. At six o'clock the line moved up and we were admitted in groups of three. Name, age, occupation, place of birth, condition of destitution and the previous night's DOS were taken with lightning-like rapidity by the superintendent. And as I turned, I was startled by a man's thrusting into my hand something that felt like a brick and shouting into my ear. Any knives, matches or tobacco? No, sir, I lied, as lied every man who entered. As I passed downstairs to the cellar, I looked at the brick in my hand and saw that by doing violence to the language, it might be called bread. By its weight and hardness, it certainly must have been unleavened. The light was very dim down in the cellar, and before I knew it, some other man had thrust a pannikin into my other hand. Then I stumbled onto a still darker room, where were benches and tables and men. The place smelled vilely, and the somber gloom and the mumble of voices from out of the obscurity made it seem more like some anteroom to the infernal regions. Most of the men were suffering from tired feet and they prefaced the meal by removing their shoes and unbinding the filthy rags with which their feet were wrapped. This added to the general noisomeness while it took away from my appetite. In fact, I found that I had made a mistake. I had eaten a hearty dinner five hours before and to have done justice to the fare before me, I should have fasted for a couple of days. The pannikin contained three quarters of a pint of skilly oatmeal mixed with water, a mixture of Indian corn and hot water. The men were dipping their bread into heaps of salt scattered over the dirty tables. I attempted the same, but the bread seemed to stick in my mouth, and I remember the words of the carpenter. You need a pint of water to eat the bread nicely. I went over into a dark corner where I had observed other men going and found the water. Then I returned and attacked the skilly. It was coarse of texture, unseasoned, gross, and bitter. This bitterness, which lingered persistently in the mouth after the skilly had passed on, I found especially repulsive. I struggled manfully, but was mastered by my qualms, and half a dozen mouthfuls of skilly and bread was the measure of my success. The man beside me ate his own share and mine to boot, scraped the pannikins, and looked hungrily for more. I met a 
Townie and he stood me too good a dinner, I explained. Oh, I haven't had a bite since yesterday morning, he replied. How about tobacco? I asked. Will the bloke bother with a fellow now? Oh, no, he answered me. No bloomin' fear. This is the easiest spike going. You ought to say some of them. Search it to the skin. The pannikins scraped clean. Conversation began to spring up. The superintendent here is always writing to the papers about us mugs, said the man on the other side of me. What does he say? I asked. Oh, he says we're no good. A load of blackguards and scoundrels as won't work. Tells us all the old tricks I've been hearing for twenty years and which I never seen a mug ever do. Last thing of his, I see, he was telling it how a mug gets out of the spike with a crust in his pocket. And when he sees a nice old gentleman coming along the street, he chucks the crust into the drain and borrows the old gentleman's stick to poke it out. And then the old gent gives him a tanner. Sixpence. A roar of applause greeted the time-honoured yarn, and from somewhere over in the deeper darkness came another voice, orating angrily. Talk of the country being good for Tommy. Food. I'd like to see it. I just came up from Dover, and bless it, little Tommy I got. They won't give you a drink of water. They won't much less Tommy. Does mugs never go out of Kent? Spoke a second voice. They live bloomin' fat all along. I came through Kent went on the first voice, still more angrily, and go blimey if I see any Tommy, and I always notices as the blokes as talks about how much they can get when they're in the spike can eat my share of skilly as well as their bloomin' own. There's chaps in London, said a man across the table from me, that get all the Tommy they want, and they never think of going to the country, stay in London the year round, nor do they think of looking for a kip place to sleep till nine or ten o'clock at night a general chorus verify this statement but they're blooming clever them chaps said an admiring voice course they are said another voice but it's not like the likes of me and you can do it you got to be born to do it i say dumb chaps have been opening cabs and selling papers since the day they was born and the fathers and mothers before them it's all in the training i say and the likes of me and you would starve at it this was also verified by the general chorus, and likewise the statement that there were mugs as lives the twelve-month round in the spike and never get a blessed bit o' tommy other than spike skilly and bread. I once got half a crown in the Stratford spike, said a new voice. Silence fell on the instant, and all listened to the wonderful tale. There was three of us breaking stones. Winter time, and the cold was cruel. Other two said they'd be blessed if they do it, and they didn't, but I kept wearing into mine to warm up, you know. And then the guardians come, and t'other chaps got run in for fourteen days. And the guardians, when they see what I'd been doing, gives me a tanner each, five of them, and turns me up. The majority of these men, nay, all of them, I found, do not like the spike, and only come to it when driven in. After the rest stop, they are good for two or three days and nights on the streets, when they are driven in again for another rest. Of course, this continuous hardship quickly breaks their constitutions, and they realize it, though only in a vague way, while it is so much the common run of things that they do not worry about it. On the DOS, they call vagabondage here, which corresponds to on the road in the United States. The agreement is that kipping or dossing or sleeping is the hardest problem they have to face, harder even than that of food. The inclement weather and the harsh laws are mainly responsible for this, while the men themselves ascribe their homelessness to foreign immigration, who take their places at lower wages and establish the sweating system. By seven o'clock we were called away to bathe and go to bed. We stripped our clothes wrapping them up in our coats and buckling our belts about them, and deposited them in a heaped rack on the floor, a beautiful scheme for the spread of vermin. Then, two by two, we entered the bathroom. There were two ordinary tubs, and this I know, the two men preceding had washed in that water. We washed in the same water, and it was not changed for the two men that followed us. This I know, but I am also certain that the twenty-two of us washed in the same water. I did no more than make a show of splashing some of this dubious liquid at myself. 
while I hastily brushed it off with a towel wet from the bodies of other men. My equanimity was not restored by seeing the back of one poor wretch, a mass of blood from attacks of vermin and retaliatory scratching. A shirt was handed me, which I could not help but wonder how many other men had worn, and with a couple of blankets under my arm I trudged off to the sleeping apartment. This was a long, narrow room, traversed by two low iron rails. Between these rails were stretched, not hammocks, but pieces of canvas, six feet long and less than two feet wide. These were the beds, and they were six inches apart and about eight inches above the floor. The chief difficulty was that the head was somewhat higher than the feet, which caused the body constantly to slip down being slung to the same rails. When one man moved, no matter how slightly, the rest were set rocking. And whenever I dozed, somebody was sure to struggle back to the position from which he had slipped, and arouse me again. Many hours passed before I won to sleep. It was only seven in the evening, and the voices of children, in shrill outcry, playing in the street continued till nearly midnight. The smell was frightful and sickening, while my imagination broke loose and my skin crept and crawled till I was nearly frantic. Grunting, groaning, and snoring arose like the sounds emitted by some sea monster, and several times, afflicted by nightmare, one or another, by his shrieks and yells, aroused the lot of us. Toward morning, I was awakened by a, a rat or some similar animal on my breast, in the quick transition from sleep to waking, before I was completely myself, I raised a shout to wake the dead. At any rate, I woke the living, and they cursed me roundly for my lack of manners. But morning came, with a six o'clock breakfast of bread and skilly, which I gave away, and we were told off to our various tasks. Some were set to scrubbing and cleaning, others to picking oakum, and eight of us were convoyed across the street to the Whitechapel Infirmary, where we were set at scavenger work. This was the method by which we paid for our skilly and canvas, and I, for one, know that I paid in full many times over. Though we had most revolting tasks to perform, our allotment was considered the best, and the other men deemed themselves lucky in being chosen to perform it. Don't touch it, mate. The nurse says it's deadly, warned my working partner as I held open a sack into which he was emptying a garbage can. It came from the sick wards, and I told him that I purposed neither to touch it nor to allow it to touch me. Nevertheless, I had to carry the sack and other sacks, down five flights of stairs and empty them in a receptacle where the corruption was speedily sprinkled with strong disinfectant. Perhaps there is a wise mercy in all this. These men of the spike, the peg, and the street are encumbrances. They are of no good or use to anyone, nor to themselves. They clutter the earth with their presence and are better out of the way, broken by hardship ill-fed, and worse, nourished. They are always the first to be struck down by disease, as they are likewise the quickest to die. They feel, themselves, that the forces of society tend to hurl them out of existence. We were sprinkling disinfectant by the mortuary when the dead wagon drove up and five bodies were packed into it. The conversation turned to the white potion and black jack and i found they were all agreed that the poor person man or woman who in the infirmary gave too much trouble or was in a bad way was polished off that is to say the incurables and the obstreperous were given a dose of black jack or the white potion and sent over the divide it does not matter in the least whether this be actually so or not the point is they have the feeling that it is so, and that they have created the language with which to express that feeling. Black Jack, white potion, polishing off. At eight o'clock we were sent down into a cellar under the infirmary, where tea was brought to us, and the hospital scraps. These were heaped high on a huge platter, in an indescribable mess. P. 
pieces of bread, chunks of grease and fat pork, the burnt skin from the outside of roasted joints, bones, in short, all the leavings from the fingers and mouths of the sick ones suffering from all manner of diseases. Into this mess, the men plunged their hands, digging, pawing, turning over, examining, rejecting, and scrambling for. It wasn't pretty. Pigs couldn't have done worse. But the poor devils were hungry, and they ate ravenously of the swill. And when they could eat no more, they bundled what was left into their handkerchiefs and thrust it inside their shirts. Once, when I was here before, what did I find out there but a whole lot of pork ribs, said Ginger to me, by out there. He meant the place where the corruption was dumped and sprinkled with strong disinfectant. They was a prime lot, no end of meat on them, and I had em into my arms and I was out the gate and down the street a looking for someone to give em to. Couldn't see a soul, and I was running, round clean crazy. The bloke running after me and thinking I was slinging me hook, running away. But just before he got me, I got an old woman and poked him into her apron. Oh charity, oh philanthropy descend to the spike and take a lesson from Ginger. At the bottom of the abyss he performed as purely an altruistic act as was ever performed outside the abyss. It was fine of Ginger, and if the old woman caught some contagion from the no end o meat on the pork ribs, it was still fine, though not so fine. But the most salient thing in this incident, it seems to me, is poor Ginger clean, crazy, at sight of so much food going to waste. It is the rule of the casual ward that a man who enters must stay two nights and a day, but I had seen sufficient for my purpose, had paid for my skilly and canvas, and was preparing to run for it. Come on, let's sling it, I said to one of my mates, pointing toward the open gate through which the dead wagon had come. And get fourteen days? No, get away. Oh, I'll come here for a rest, he said complacently. And another night's kip won't hurt me none. They were all of this opinion, so I was forced to sling it alone. You can't ever come back again here for a doss, they warned me. No fear, said I, with an enthusiasm they could not comprehend. And, dodging out the gate, I sped down the street, 